When I think back to my college career years from now, I know I'll look back on it fondly. I think this will partly be due to the memories that stem from the art that I was exposed to during this time in my life. Even now, there are moments from these past few years that come to mind frequently, and I'd like to share one of these to start this video. In mid-2015, I was forced into a Hawaiian vacation with my now wife and group of friends. It was an absolute blast, but at the time, I was worried about the trip. I have two normal fears for someone being born and raised in Montana. I'm terrified of the ocean, and I'm terrified of sharks. So while flying over the ocean, I tried to keep myself distracted. My Nintendo 3DS helped, but not enough as I would have liked. So I poured over a book that was recommended to me prior to the vacation. And that book was The Road by Cormac McCarthy. I remember devouring this book on flights and during layovers. It was an incredible juxtaposition. I'm in probably the most beautiful and sunshine-filled state that I've ever seen. And my face is buried in one of the darkest and most depressing stories that I've ever read. I was enamored with that novel after my first read. And even now, I've yet to find a book that connected with me quite like that. And one of the reasons it connected with me, in such a profound way, is because I'd already been told that story before. By a video game. And that game is The Last of Us. These two stories share a post-apocalyptic setting, focus on the relationship between father and child, and reveal the truth that some of the scariest things imaginable come with the quiet. It amazes me that these two works seem to speak to each other in such a cohesive fashion, but before we explore how they do so, it's important to discuss the matter in which they were released to the public, and why post-apocalyptic tales were some of the last things readers and gamers expected from Cormac McCarthy and Naughty Dog Game Studios, respectively. Let's jump into something more exciting. Let's watch the opening sequence of Uncharted 2 a Naughty Dog game created years before The Last of Us. This will give us a feel for what these famous action games and this game studio presented in terms of tone and gameplay. What did everyone notice in that clip? Was it the blood? Was it the handsome protagonist with a great sense of humor in the face of danger? Was it the orchestrated soundtrack that swelled with the action? Was it the fact that the game's first mission presents players with the challenge of climbing out of a train that's also dangling off an icy cliff? I hope you all noticed how these elements combine in order to create a really polished presentation for that game. And trust me on this one, that game really takes its foot off the gas pedal. It's action set piece after action set piece. It's a consistent montage of gunfights and witty quips from that protagonist, Nathan Drake. So when The Last of Us was announced, this is what fans of Naughty Dog had come to expect from their beloved game creators. A game set in the zombie apocalypse, and one with such a heavy reliance on stealth-based mechanics, was a bit of a surprise to say the least. It's not uncommon for artists to change their creative vision and have the desire to try something new. We see this happen all the time with musicians, filmmakers, actors, and of course, authors. So let's jump back to Cormac McCarthy and discuss the type of novel he was writing before The Road. 
Before writing The Road, Cormac McCarthy was most known for writing westerns, but these were far from your typical westerns. Blood Meridian is the book that perhaps McCarthy is most known for. In this tale, readers witness a bleak landscape mapped by the acts of horrendous violence. In a sense, the violence itself seems to consume the novel. Characters, plot, and poetics seem to play second fiddle to the violent acts present in the novel. Even the antagonist seems to be chaos, violence, and immorality personified. Let's listen to a passage from this novel in order to witness these elements McCarthy presents. Now driving in a wild frieze of headlong horses, with eyes walled and teeth cropped, and naked riders with clusters of arrows clenched in their jaws, and their shields winking in the dust, and up the far side of the ruined ranks in a piping of bone flutes, and dropping down off the side of their mouths with one heel hung in the wither strap, and their short bows flexing beneath the outstretched necks of the ponies, until they had circled the company and cut their ranks in two, and then rising up again like funhouse figurines, some with nightmare faces painted on their breasts, riding down the unhorsed Saxons, and spearing and clubbing them and leaping from their mounts with knives, and running about on the ground with a peculiar bandy-legged trot, like creatures driven to alien forms of locomotion, and stripping the clothes from the dead and seizing them up by the hair and passing their blades about the skulls of living and dead alike, and snatching aloft the bloody wigs and hacking and chopping at the naked bodies, ripping off limbs, heads, gutting the strange white torsos, and holding up great hands of viscera, genitals, and s some of the savages were so slathered up with gore they might have rolled in it like dogs, and some who fell upon the dying and sodomized them with loud cries to their fellows. And now the horses of the dead came pounding out of the smoke and dust, and circled with flapping leather and wild manes and eyes whited with fear, like the eyes of the blind. And some were feathered with arrows, and some lanced through, and stumbling and vomiting blood as they wheeled across the killing ground, and clattered from sight again. Dust stanched the wet and naked heads of the scalped, who with the fringe of hair below their wounds and tonsured to the bone, now lay like maimed and naked monks in the blood slaked dust, and everywhere the dying groaned and gibbered, and horses lay screaming. Now what did everyone notice in this reading? Was it the way gore is described? Was it the lack of punctuation and how the scene just seems to go on and on and on? Did you feel lost in all that chaos? Like Uncharted, this novel presents plenty of action set pieces and gunfights, and in a sense, these harrowing moments are the most memorable portions of the book because they seem to haunt readers long after turning that last page. Cormac McCarthy's run of Western narratives continued in the 1990s with the Border Trilogy. Even in 2005, No Country for Old Men was published, and this novel can be seen as a neo-Western. In McCarthy's catalog, The Road is an Outlier. While it can be viewed as unconventional given McCarthy's repertoire, The Road is one of the most important novels written this century and it's an undeniable success. It seems to represent many of society's contemporary fears. Harsh climate, nuclear fallout, the fall of civilization, it's all there. It's also incredible to think about the way in which this novel succeeds. Typical character names are rejected. Instead, we get the man and the boy. There are antagonistic forces but the type of villain McCarthy had used before, like Anton Chigurh in No Country for Old Men, or the Judge in Blood Meridian, they're discarded in favor of nameless, cannibalistic, horrifying groups. If Blood Meridian presents a surplus of action and violence to the reader, The Road presents bleak minimalism. Sure, there's action and tense moments, but the novel uses long stretches of quiet moments and simple dialogue between a father and son. The novel is sad, but there's a glimmer of hope that shines in moments while reading. The relationship between father and son is written with such a genuine chemistry that all the actions in the novel seem to support this relationship until the novel's conclusion. McCarthy also presents horror in an interesting way in this novel compared to the other works of his. Even this aspect of the novel is methodical and rather quiet. The scariest scene I've ever read in any book ever, ever, is in this novel. 
Let's listen to a reading of this scene in order to understand how McCarthy's poetics here differ and compare to the earlier mentioned scene from Blood Meridian. He stared down the rough wooden steps. He ducked his head and then flicked the lighter and swung the flame out over the darkness like an offering. Coldness and damp, an ungodly stench. The boy clutched at his coat. He could see part of a stone wall, a clay floor, an old mattress darkly stained. He crouched and stepped out again and held out the light. Huddled against the back wall were naked people, male and female, all trying to hide, shielding their faces with their hands. On the mattress lay a man with his legs gone to the hip, and the stumps of them blackened and burnt. The smell was hideous. Jesus, he whispered. Then one by one they turned and blinked in the pitiful light. Help us, they whispered. Please help us. Christ, he said. Oh, Christ. He turned and grabbed the boy. Hurry, he said. Hurry. He dropped the lighter. No time to look. He pushed the boy up the stairs. Help us, they called. Hurry. A bearded face appeared blinking at the foot of the stairs. Please, he called. Please. Hurry. For God's sakes, hurry. He shoved the boy through the hatch and sent him sprawling. He stood and got hold of the door and swung it over, let it slam down. He turned and grabbed the boy, but the boy had gotten up and was doing his little dance of terror. For the love of God, will you come on, he hissed. But the boy was pointing out something in the window, and when he looked he went cold all over. Coming across the field toward the house were four bearded men and two women. He grabbed the boy by the hand. Christ, he said, run, run. This scene really gets under my skin because the poetic techniques used here are almost the exact opposite of what a reader would expect in a work like Blood Meridian. In this passage, sentences are rather short. Every word of dialogue is forced in desperation. There's horrific imagery and a claustrophobic setting. The scene is incredibly cinematic. Look at the way McCarthy uses lighting to achieve an emotional response. It's almost as if he's writing action lines from a screenplay. Part of McCarthy as a writer exists in cinema, and this is where I believe cinematic gameplay experiences like The Last of Us and McCarthy's novels converse. To illustrate this point, let's look at a pretty complicated diagram illustrating this effect. I'm kidding when it comes to the diagram, but not the point being made. In these works, striving for the cinematic is a recurrent theme. This is evident in small details in each work, all the way to how larger scenes operate in the narrative. Discussing the smaller details of the novel and the game, I think it's interesting to look at how objects operate within the worlds created. For example, let's take a look at a scene from the road involving a map. These are our roads. The black lines on the map. The state roads. Why are they the state roads? Because they used to belong to the states. But what used to be called states. But there's not any more states? No. Within this scene, we learn a few things. The boy's lack of knowledge of the old world is presented. We also learn that the states are no more, which only leads us to imagine what happened to the country. This key information stems from the map, but this is now the map's only function. It's a prop. Successful films' use of maps is very similar to this. Literally filming a map is boring, but playing off that map and the information it contains and how that affects characters is what makes it interesting in the world of film. How does the use of maps in The Last of Us compare with this then? Surprisingly, it's eerily similar. Given the nature of the genre, many games live and die by their use of maps. Look at any of the popular open world games of the last decade. The map is such an important aspect of the game because it orients players in an unfamiliar three-dimensional environment. But The Last of Us rejects this use of the map. Instead, maps are seen as more of a collectible item. They give very little information. And by doing so, they tell players a bit more about the world of the game in a different way. In the destroyed world of The Last of Us, the player has to remap the world because so much has changed with the downfall of society. Roads are collapsed, buildings are in shambles, fences surround cities for safety now. The world is not as it once was. This is what maps tell players in the game. I mentioned earlier, regarding the basement scene, that it used lighting to great effect, so I'd like to continue that point here. 
One thing I really appreciate about McCarthy is his ability to use lighting in interesting ways for a novelist. This is evident in much of The Road, but it extends into more of his books. The opening of Cities of the Plain uses lighting in an almost cinematic way. Being a visual medium, I'd argue that lighting is more important in video games than novels, but prior to The Last of Us, many studios only provided day and night cycles of lighting. In PlayStation's documentary about making the game, Naughty Dog employees discuss that they approach lighting the game in a new way. Just look at the way it's implemented in this record store. The way it pours in from openings like the door and the way it softens when it meets the windows is such an important way to portray the scene's mood. And somehow, as a novelist, McCarthy captures the spirit as well. It's conclusion time! All these similarities are interesting to examine, but do these works sharing so many concepts, motifs, and techniques actually mean anything? For me, I'd argue that of course they do. As an industry and art form, video games are still relatively new. So the fact that a game like The Last of Us can seemingly shift the game industry as a whole and push the boundaries of quality and writing in said industry is undeniably exciting. When a game can be aptly compared and reviewed similarly to a Pulitzer Prize winning novel, it gives me hope that more of the general public will consider the medium as an equal with novels and films. I also think that video games can offer something to the world of literature. My appreciation of McCarthy initially stemmed from my understanding of games. The novel as a form allows people to develop a lengthy rapport with characters and their thoughts in a unique space. Single-player, narrative-driven games mirror this effect better than a film, painting, or even a poem can. To be a more appreciative gamer, I think it's important to understand how literature and how classic archetypes, narrative structures, and characters influence the medium. And for those primarily in literature studies, I'd argue that studying and playing games will open eyes as to how games can and will influence writing in general in the coming years. Video games are cool. Literature is cool. So in conclusion, that's cool, man. Is that the end? Yep. <laughs>